Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday service. Glad to see you all here. Although we are open, we will continue live streaming and posting these services for our virtual attendees. I'm Grace Price, a member of the worship committee, and I will be one of your worship associates today. You will also hear from Dinah Rowe, our church treasurer, and Adam Wedeking, chair of our social and environmental justice committee, and most importantly for these Sunday meetings, master of the camera and Zoom. Thank you, Adam. Our song selection is provided by our music coordinator, Alec Peck. Thank you, Alec. We are happy to have you all here with us and welcome you to join in and worship with an open mind and an open heart. Please do remember to turn down your electronic devices. There are a few changes to be aware of for those in the sanctuary. Our doors are open, but of course the pandemic is not over. So while we are here, please keep your masks on and socially distance. The downside of being here is there is no singing or chanting. For the time being, those of you at home can serve as our virtual choir. As we, begin, as we begin the program, I'd like to ask you to think of the various reasons why we are all here today and answer some of our questions. How many of us appreciate that we can escape all the noise of the outside world and find a weekly moment of peace and fellowship? How many of us value the opportunity to explore, question, and share diverse beliefs, opinions, and observations in a safe and trusted community? Hold on one second. I'm trying to get the computer to work. There you go. How many of us gathered here today are here to actively practice our principles and live our own personal truths? The community we share here at UC UUCR is a special and valuable one that all of us create and sustain. Our presence and participation is what makes it unique. Let's all play an active part in ensuring that we keep our local flame alive here in Riverside. And now I invite you to sit back and take a slow, deep breath as we move into our worship hour. For our call to worship, you are welcome to read with me the mission statement of this church. Our mission is to foster a diverse religious community that celebrates life, affirms the individual, encourages spiritual growth and open thought, and works to advance social justice and environmental sustainability. Our first hymn is We Laugh, We Cry. Please sing in your heads. Dedicate our minds and hearts to the spirit of this 
exiles that we believe in life and in the strength of love and we have found our time to be together and with the grace of age we share the wonder of youth and we believe that growing is an answer our lives are full of wonder and our time is death of one among us fills us all with pain and grief. But as we live, so shall we die, and when our lives are done, the memories we shed with friends, they will linger on and on. And we believe in life and in the strength of love, and we have found a place to be together. We have the right to Thank you, Tinka, Alec, and Kate. Our sermon description today is as follows. Our Unitarian and Universalist roots go back to the beginning of this country, and we've always been considered liberals, activists, and progressives. It's easier to point to our deeds than explain our beliefs. But we came together, together in 1961, and as a Unitarian Universalist, we covenant to affirm and support seven principles. These are not dogma or doctrine, but rather a guide for those of us who choose to join and participate in Unitarian and Universalist religious communities. This community, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, has been here since 1881 and has endured good times and bad, and now a pandemic. It is time for us to embrace this church that we all love. Bonnie said she first attended a UU church when she was 20 years old and knew she was home. She became a member of UUCR in 1996, soon after moving to Riverside, and quickly became active in the Social Justice Committee. After she retired, she discovered she was busier than ever with volunteer work here at the church, several political and social justice groups, and with animal rescue. There are a few announcements we would like to share. During the service, we will mention several website and email addresses and phone numbers. At the end of the service, we will leave up a slide with all this information and it is available on our website. However, for those needing the information by auditory means, they will be announced verbally during the service. Chat time provides an opportunity to spend an hour talking among ourselves, usually beginning with the service and leading on to various topics. It's held on Zoom at 11.30 or a half hour after the service ends. To participate in person, space will de be determined depending on the number of participants and safety <clears throat> per pandemic regulations. To participate online, you will need a separate Zoom link. So please go to our website at uuchurchofriverside.org for the Zoom chat time link. Now I will turn to Adam Wedeking for some social environmental justice announcements.
Good morning. We've got a few social and environmental justice announcement meetings, I guess. Um, message, uh, messages from the Social and Environmental Justice Committee. Uh, but first of all, our, we meet second, um, sorry, third and, when do we meet? First and third Sunday of the month. Um, and we didn't meet last Sunday, but we will be meeting next Sunday on the 18th. Again, for the information, you can go to the website, click on justice, click on social and environmental justice. Uh, one thing coming up this week, go ahead and next slide, Lee, um, is the Social and Environmental Justice Committee voted to support SB 731, which is uh, sunsetting criminal convictions. Um, this gives people who have um, done their time um, and done their time on parole or probation, the opportunity uh, for relief from those, um, from that conviction. Uh, there is an opportunity for everybody really to get involved in, in the process of passing these bills. Um, this bill will be at the public the Senate Public Safety Committee on Tuesday at 1.30 in the afternoon. Um, and the way the hearings in these committees work is the uh, campaign that is working for the bill, the author of the bill will present their evidence um, in favor of the bill. And then uh, organizations and individuals have an opportunity not to say your part about it, but just to say who you are and that you support the bill. They call them Me Too's. It's not, you don't need to have a whole long thing to say about the bill, just say, my name is Adam Wedeking. I'm from the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, and I support this bill. Um, and then they have an opportunity for the people who are opposed to the bill to do the same thing. So to get information on how to do that, again, go to the um, uuchurchriverside.org, the, the justice tab, and then social and environmental justice, and under take action, there's a link to the um, Senate Public Safety Committee website that tells you how to do it. The, the phone number and access code will be updated the evening before the meeting. So that morning you can go on and find the number and the access code that you'll need to get on. Um, and that's it for social environmental justice. Thank you. Okay, thanks again for your patience. <laughs> Okay, so now we're on COVID. The prospects ahead are positive. If we can all just hang on to our sanity a little longer. Because these vaccines are all new, it just takes time to find out how long they will be effective. There's new data showing the Pfizer vaccine remains over 90% effective for at least six months. And it also prevented infection from the B1351, AKA the South African variant. Vaccinations are now available for all Californians aged 50 and up and 16 and up on April 15th. On March 31st, Riverside County announced that they had vaccinated more than 1 million vaccines. Quite a milestone. You can sign up for your vaccine at myturn.ca.gov. The newsletter comes out <clears throat> the first of every month, and we'd like to hear anything that you'd like to share. Uh, if you'd like to write something, please contact Dinah Rowe at ramblinrose22 at yahoo.com. We have two lightings of sacred flames. The first is the Occupied Indigenous Peoples Remembrance Candle. The second is the lighting of our own chalice, the symbol of our faith. Let us never forget that the sacred space which we occupy was first the sacred space of the Marango people. The Marango Band of Mission Indians is a mixture of several different small groups of Californian Indians, including the Serrano, the Kawiya, and the Cupeño. 
let us acknowledge that we walk upon the traditional territories of the Maranga people, the people of this land who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. In honor of the Maranga people, we, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, light this sacred flame as the stewards of this sacred and holy place. We are blessed with a space and opportunity to strive to live out our common principles, to bring justice, equity, and compassion into our daily lives, to resist all that threatens the earth and her people, and to live out our dream of a world community of peace, liberty, and justice for all. Let these thoughts carry us forth as we journey and worship together. So we had a double dose today. <laughs> Today's reading of the chalice lighting is Drawn Together by Jennifer Grayson. We come together every week, bound not by a creed or a mutual desire to please one God or many gods. Yet we are drawn together by a belief that how we are in the world, who we are, matters. We light this chalice together in the knowledge that love, not fear, can change this world. And now, please join us in spirit uh, as we play Spirit of Life. Thank you.
And now we will have Diana Rowe <clears throat> come and speak to us regarding uh, our stewardship. Good morning. Do we have a couple? Can you hear me? Do we have a couple of people for volunteer for ushers? This portion of our service is about funding all that we do to care. This portion of our service is about funding all that we do to care for our congregation and our beloved historic church. In addition to contributing today, there are several other ways you can contribute. You may mail your donations and pledge to the church office. You can also donate to the church using your smartphone and using the QR code on the church website and the newsletter, which you can scan with your phone and donate. The church address is shown. Our administrator, Robert, pays the bills and answers inquiries to the church, plus either other items which come up on a daily basis. Please do your part by contributing what you can. A reminder that the annual pledge drive is underway. I have pledge forms with me and there's also some on the desk out there. Please turn in your pledge form as soon as possible as this is how we plan the budget for the new fiscal year, which begins in July. We're gonna have a drawing for a nice gift basket on the first Sunday in May for all those who turn in a pledge form. I will have Stater Brothers shopping cards with me each Sunday here in the church. Staters gives a 6% rebate back to the church at no extra cost to you. You may also contact Robert in the church office to purchase Stater Brothers cards. Please donate whatever, by whatever method works best for you. Thank you for your generosity. And to those who give of their time and talent, thank you for your generous care and attention. Our next hymn will be From You I Receive. Please rise again in spirit and join us. Meditation for today is a house for our dreams by Dory Jane Summers. We, all of us, build houses for our dreams. The masonry and lumber, glass and tiles, a solid form wherein we see our hopes, a shelter and protection for our growth. This house shall be a dwelling place for courage, for integrity, for love, engendered, nourished by a family that speaks of we and means all humankind. These walls shall represent the privacy and dignity of individuals. The open doors, a welcome to all people, all ages and all generations. The windows shall keep light of inquiry, illumining from outside and within. May all words spoken here be born of love 
an energy rekindle in the hearts of those who dreamed this house, who plied the tools and paid the price to actualize the dream. May dreaming never cease for those within who know the world to be a troubled place, but dare to struggle with imperfectness toward that brighter hope, that better day. Let memories add warmth, a heritage, a quilted patchwork stitched with history of kindness, of daring for the good, of funny moments, jokes, and smiles and tears. This is a precious place, as every home that shelters those who love and strive and share. Its blessing is in lives that meet within, in living, learning, caring, sheltered here. Now we will welcome Bonnie McFarland to speak to us on covenant and commitment. Transfer of the earbuds. I have it on good authority. Earbud to earbud does not transmit the virus. <laughs> Thank goodness. That'll be something to get used to here. Okay. Good morning. From their origins, Unitarians and Universalists have been faiths deeply rooted in the morality behind the dogma. Both the Unitarians and Universalists drew as reactions to Calvinism in this country in the mid to late, to late 17th century. Calvinism was not a separate faith, but a theology within most of New England's Protestant churches, which taught in short that God is an absolute monarch on whom we are totally dependent. That we are predestined to hell, except for the chosen elect, and that humanity is made up of the saved and the damned. So why do good? There's a bit of a problem, other than it was believed that the chosen elect would be better at it. Universalism is the older movement by 30 to 40 years, it originated among lay people, mainly in the hill country of central New England, an area that was then frontier. They were generally from a less privileged, less well-educated social class than the Unitarians. Universalists generally left their churches to build their own new meeting houses. The Universalist Church of America was founded in 1793. Hosea Ballou, who was the principal Universalist leader for more than 40 years, was born in a log cabin in Richmond, New Hampshire, and had less than two years formal education. Unitarianism, on the other hand, originated among Harvard-educated clergy. The original American Unitarian Association was founded in 1825. 
Unitarians were more likely to be the ministers and leading members who stayed where they were and led their congregations in a more liberal direction. William Ellery Channing, the Unitarian counterpart to Hosea Ballou, was born to an aristocratic family in Newport, Rhode Island, and was sent to Harvard. Even in this early formative period, while there were differences between the two, you can see the early beginnings of what is now the combined Unitarian Universalist faith, a covenantal, not creedal religion based on seven principles. Universalism, the earlier lay-led movement, believed God was conceived as still an absolute monarch experienced through nature, God's other, other book, on whom we are totally dependent. That cha change was, that was little changed. Salvation, that was changed. God elects to save everyone. God is love from the book of John. Salvation, irrespective of character. For these universalists, why do good works? It's the way to be happy in life. Churches exist to teach this subtle truth. About hum humanity, they said, it is a community of moral equals bound by ties of mutual concern. In Unitarianism, they believed God was less like a monarch, which was an old world idea, and more like the US president, an executor of laws to which he was also subject, so they believed. Moral laws are natural laws, discoverable by human intelligence. W.E. Channing said, we venerate not the loftiness of God's throne, but the equity and goodness in which it is established. On salvation, they said, predestination is unfair. Now that sounds rather like you, you. Unfair, throw it out. Instead, it is salvation by character. As to humanity, still the sa saved and the damned, but you had a chance and it's up to you. So they both took significant, significant steps for their time. For the universalists, God is still an absolute monarch, but kinder. Everyone gets saved no matter what. Humanity is a collection of moral equals. For the Unitarians, God is modeled after the newly created presidency of the newly created United States. Predestination is out. You have to earn your way by good deeds. Then there goes on a long history of challenges from the left to both faiths and to the combined UU faith after we were united in 1961. Of course, there were challenges from the right, those who wanted us to be more restrictive in our outlook, more narrow in our worldview, but that was not our path. The challenge is to be more compassionate and to take action is what took root. We've been activists from our earliest days, from the abolitionists to suffragists, from Selma, Alabama, 1965, to LGBTQ rights. Our faith has led us there. But that's another story or two, another sermon sometime. It's good to know our history. I really enjoy learning about it. Helps me for, feel more grounded, especially when I try to explain our faith to someone. That's a little more difficult here in California than it is back east, where there's a lot more of us. And explaining is what we, as we all know, can be difficult. And Grace will come up here and help me with this. <laughs> so it might, might go something like. So what do you believe in that church? Well, we have many individual beliefs, but we support each other in our search for truth and meaning. And we have seven principles that. Wait a minute. You do believe in God, don't you? Um, well, and so on. Uh, I've always said, partly tongue-in-cheek, 
that a problem is that we don't speak in sound bites, but in paragraphs, and things get lost there. So I heard about another discussion a minister had that worked a little bit better. It went something like this. I explain that we are a covenantal faith, not a creedal faith. We share a covenant of how we try to be together, not a creed of what we all must believe together. Well, does your church believe in the Bible? That is a creedal question. We are a covenantal church. We share a covenant of how we try to be together, not what we are expected to believe together. Does your church believe in God? Again, that is a creedal question. We are a covenantal church. We share a covenant of how we try to be together, not what we are expected to believe together. So you can believe anything you want? I think it's our covenant that is really important. We covenant to affirm and promote our seven principles. Let me tell you about those. Well, I don't know. It still takes paragraphs. What does covenant mean? According to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, a covenant is a formal and serious agreement or promise. What are our seven principles? Well, they're on the back of your order of service that you didn't get today because we had some glitches. <laughs> but they're on the website and on the um, banner in the parish hall and lots of other places. We're all familiar with them. So I'm not going to go into details about those today either because that's another whole sermon or two. But this covenant of seven principles is what makes us unique. More than that, it's what makes us uniquely relevant and important. Whether we're talking about issues dominating the local or national stage, Unitarian Universalists will be and have always been there. When I first started coming to this church in 1995, we had not had a minister in 17 years. Of course, there were two factions, those who thought we were doing just fine, thank you very much, and those who desperately wanted to hire a minister. Within a, within a year, we hired a minister, and the faction that didn't agree continued to agitate. Now, when things go wrong like this, I hear people blame our church. I've seen such rifts in lots of other places, and I think it's just human nature. But here, without the threat of hellfire and damnation, you need strong guidance to heal the rifts. And that's where we've often been lacking. I've been told by somebody or other almost every few years since I got here that this year was probably our last. And I've definitely been told that every year for about the last seven or eight, that um, at least since I've been more involved and worthy of such confidings that the end is coming and our doors are closing. I've even heard that when our membership was double what it is now and the budget far, far larger. Of course, many weren't sure we were gonna make it or through the closure this past year. Actually, many were sure we weren't going to make it through the closure this past year. But here we are. It was tight. We couldn't do all the things we wanted, but we survived. My answer has always been, we've been here since 1881. We aren't leaving. It is kind of amazing when you think about it. In recent years, we've been through a lot. Every minister we have hired for as long as I've been here was new in their profession. We were their first church. I attribute a lot of the turnover to just that. They didn't have yet the skills to help us avoid the unavoidable or to heal the unavoidable rifts. That, and I have this on good authority from some other ministers, they occur in every church. Well, folks, we have reopened, and so far it looks like California might possibly be able to avoid another surge and close down. And it's spring. That means we are nearing the end of our fiscal year. 
do you realize we have not been able to have even one single fundraiser in over a year? Wow. And we are still here. So in the spring is when we begin planning the financial future of the church, planning the budget for next year. And that is based on the pledges of our members. If you aren't a member yet, good time to join. Of course, our income last year was severely reduced. We're in the middle of a pledge drive right now and the picture isn't looking too good. I'm not one, obviously, to predict doom and gloom. But unless the members of our esteemed church remember why they are members, remember the value we feel in their lives as well as in the community, we will continue to limp through another year. But it doesn't have to be that way. Some of us tend to hold on to pessimistic views despite the contrary evidence. We actually have some new faces and a few new members and some enthusiasm for outreach project projects despite a year of pandemic. I think that's pretty awesome. I know you love this church. You wouldn't still be here in body or Zoom after this past very strange year. There are many ways to give to this church, but today I'm not going to talk about the non-monetary ways. I will do that another time. And if we don't have the monetary, obviously there's no need for the other. I hope you've enjoyed the speakers we've had this year. I think we've done a pretty good job. But other than Joan to Artemis, none of them this fiscal year have been paid speakers. Let me repeat that. Not one of our speakers since July 1st have been paid, except Joan. And good volunteers are getting harder to find because I've pretty much tapped out all my reserves. So, so the point of this is, if you'd like to be able to hear some <coughs> UU ministers or ministers in training, We need to be able to pay them. Do you miss Michael Boblet? I know some really love him. Others could live without him. But he lives in San Diego, and he's a retired UU minister. And there's some new pairs of, pair of lungs that started coming to our church, <laughs> despite a pandemic. So Michael Boblet lives in San Diego. He's a retired UU minister, and he would need to be paid. One example. Over this past year, I've been contacted by a variety of UU ministers and MDiv students from around the country, some of them local, who give sermons and even entire services online. Some are close enough to be able to come in as we open up. But they need and deserve to be paid. I began this by talking about the history of our faith and wound up talking about the pledge drive. You may think in an odd path, but I often think we you use undervalue our own faith. I think we love our church, but we don't value it as we should. We expect a lot and we're quick to criticize. But everybody gets all cringy when it comes time to talk about money needed to run things. I'm put in mind sometimes that the Christmas classic, It's a Wonderful Life. If we could just go back and see the role we have played in our community, large and small, but the many things we know of and the things we don't, then project forward to, be, to see what it would be like if we weren't here we might think of things a little bit differently. We might value what we have a little more. In the Lutheran church where I grew up, pledging was standardized and lots of guilt and shame available for the non-compliant. Once a year, everybody got a box of small envelopes, 52 of them, with your name and date pre-printed 
and you are expected to tithe. Here we send out a letter and promise a gift basket drawing for the lucky person who returns their pledge form by May 1st. By the way, I don't know what will be in the basket other than one very cute little dragon who I promise will guard your home from all evildoers. <laughs> I donated this and it's going into the basket. And if any of you want to donate something a little more enticing, please talk to Dinah. <laughs> now there's another way to give, see? So we, the church and congregation of UUC, are, are here. We aren't living, leaving, but we could be so much larger, more vibrant, more dynamic, with more and greater financial and volunteer support of our member and friends. That's it. That's the only thing that will make the difference. Close your eyes for a moment and imagine in this best of all possible worlds, what would you like to see our church be like? What would you change? What's needed for us to get there? There's a banner in the parish hall that I've tried to live by ever since I first heard it sometime back in the 60s. If you're not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. If you're like me and have had good intentions, but my dog ate my pledge form, <laughs> I did lose my pledge form. We have blanks available in the parish hall after service. There'll be some on the desk outside. Again, and you can, you can look for and talk to our treasurer, Dinah. She also has some. So in conclusion, I want to add that part of being a member of this church is to also recognize the economic as well as the other forms of diversity among our members. And acceptance and support for each other as we traverse on our paths is an important part of who we are. We want members to pledge, even if it is to pledge zero. And we hope others will know to add in a little more to cover for those who cannot. Over the years, I've had the pleasure of watching many find their footing here and find their way out of homelessness and able to increase their pledges from zero up to much more. It is the pledge, the covenant to be part of our community that is important and that is what we're really all about. And at this point, I'll turn it back to Grace because I don't remember what our closing hymn is. Oh, no, I don't. So I will give this back to Grace. Written in the slide. Thank you, Bonnie. I didn't know what the hymn was either until I just saw it up there. <laughs> so our clothing hymn is Love Will Guide Us. Okay. 
Our benediction today is May You Be Filled by Eric Williams. May you be filled with the blessings of this covenanted community. May you carry them with you as you depart from here. May you discover the places in the world where these blessings are needed. May you have the courage to share them. May there be an open place within you to receive the blessings of the people whom you will meet along the way. Namaste, amen, and blessed be. Thank you, Bonnie McFarland, for sharing your valuable time and insight with all of us at UUCR. It is sincerely appreciated, and we know you will visit us again. And thank you all for your patience as we go through our growing pains.